All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Steve Baker. Um, I am an engineer at Red Hat who focuses on uh, bare metal provisioning. And I put this talk together to aim at people who are considering um, designing and deploying their own bare metal provisioning um, environment, or people who already have a bare metal pr provisioning environment and they'd like their design decisions to be validated, or I don't know, they'd like to experience regret. Um, but actually, no, it's, it's relevant for existing deployments as well, because it's, it's going to cover some relatively new features that do have impl implementations for deployment architecture, uh, as well as some future pipeline things which will uh, have some, make some differences in the future. Um, first, I'd like to go through a representative sample of uh, Ironic installers. Um, you know, like all OpenStack components, there's, there's a, a few options for deploying Ironic. Um, and each of those options often have uh, some opinionated defaults about architecture. So I'd just like to go through those. And uh, as, as we go through, we'll learn uh, different uh, use cases for Ironic and different capabilities it has that different installers um, will expose. Um, but before, before we get specific, I just want to, I've, I've put together this sort of call sequence diagram of a typical bare metal node uh, provisioning <coughs> process. Um, when I say typical, I mean IPMI um, and in a traditional sort of uh, level two network kind of scenario. So when a user triggers a deploy, um, Ironic will um, initially send some IPMI commands to switch the boot device to Pixie and power the device on. Once that device comes up, DHC request will go out. It will be responded to by a DHCP server, which is managed by Ironic. And that response will include um, a, a payload that needs to be downloaded uh, via TFTP. Uh, that payload is actually IPIXI, which is another Pixie-like environment, but it has the features that we require. So once IPIXI is running, um, it will be instructed to download Ironic Python agent via HTTP. And then once that is actually executing, then the actual deployment process starts, where there's two-way uh, communication between the agent and Ironic, uh, during which there will be uh, an image download via HTTP. Um, and then finally, as a final action, uh, uh, there'll be an IPMI command to switch the uh, boot device back to a real disk, and the device, the device will be powered on, and that's the end of the provisioning process. So I'd like you to keep this in mind as we, as we go through um, various uh, installers and other scenarios. Um, first installer I'd like to cover is Bifrost. Um, it's more of an appliance-based approach, so by default it's single node, um, and it's, meant to be, it's, it's aimed to be uh, as simple as possible to get going on you know, any machine. Uh, notable things to look at, um, so we have one Ironic All um, service, which is a combination of the API and the conductor. Um, we are in the process of merging an inspector back into the Ironic code base, so in the future that will disappear as well. Um, DNS mask serves the purpose of both DHCP and TFTP, and Nginx for HTTP transfers. MariaDB for storage, um, and overall, the, the, these services are all managed by systemd. Um, and on the bottom there, we have a um, provisioning network interface that's attached to the bare metal nodes on the same level two network. Um, we're gonna be coming back to that uh, situation quite a lot in this talk. Now, another uh, appliance like uh, deployment is Metal cubed. Uh, this is deployed on Kubernetes, but it's quite different to Bifrost. Um, for a start, the end user is not interacting with Ironic uh, APIs at all, like they are with Bifrost. Uh, instead, they are interacting with Kubernetes resources, and there is a bare metal operator which is responsible for um, starting Ironic when it, needs, when it needs to be started, and um, and converging the state um, so that the, the nodes that need to, need to be deployed are reflect, uh, what's reflected in the, in the resource. 
So this is immediately very different to, to a traditional uh, OpenStack or ironic deployment. But we do have the similarity on the back end. There needs to be a provisioning uh, network interface uh, that the pod can attach to directly um, with the bare metal nodes uh, also on that same network. And which can be tricky in a Kubernetes uh, environment to have that kind of access to bare metal. Uh, currently, with Metal Cubed, uh, the solution for that is to run it in the run the pod in the network host network namespace. Um, there are different. You can uh, run Metal Cubed with uh, MariaDB, but in this case, it's running SQLite. And in fact, in some uh, scenarios. Um, there's an effort to make the ironic as ephemeral as possible. So the state is the Kubernetes resource, and uh, ironic's only brought up when operations are actually in progress. So it's really pushing the boat out of the concept of uh, an appliance in this case. So it's, it's, it's quite unique. So now I want to move on to um, some triple O architectures. Um, I, I know that you know, feature development has stopped in Wallaby, but uh, Triple O is going to be around for a long time, and I think it's uh, it's, it's useful to look at the, both the undercloud and the overcloud. So, um, with the undercloud, we're starting to add some um, OpenStack components that uh, add value that support the deploy and overcloud uh, scenario. Um, as you can see, Ironic API and Ironic Conductor are now split out into uh, two separate services. Um, communicating via Rabbit, just like in a normal OpenStack. Um, we have Neutron in the picture now um, to allow for some more complex um, network configuration scenarios. And also, it's generally responsible for DHCP responses. So now Ironic is communicating with uh, Neutron when it wants to, um, when it says, we're deploying this, this node needs to uh, be served, this, uh, this content over TFTP. Which means that, DN that DNS mask is now only serving the function of TFTP. Um, I'm going to gloss over inspector and DHCP issues just for simplicity. And you know, again, on the bottom, we've got provisioning network. Um, I'm not going to uh, diagram out uh, full network architectures uh, just for simplicity and to keep the scope to uh, things related purely to the beam metal provisioning. And then when we move to the overcloud, we get to what I would consider is representative of uh, most of the other uh, installers, where it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an open stack cloud um, focused on you know, probably Nova, but it also has uh, Ironic uh, running uh, with the uh, Nova Ironic drivers enabled. And um, there is a Nova compute running on each of the control plane nodes um, that it's configured for Ironic. So that means end users are going to be interacting with um, Nova uh, in many scenarios to, um, to do the provisioning. Um, in this case, we have you know, three HA controller nodes. Uh, we've got HA proxy for load balancing to the, access the, um, the a API services. Um, but you know, different installers, it'll just be different you know, slightly different variations on this, different combinations of um, services on different nodes, et cetera. So I think this is like representative of a, of a traditional, you know, uh, ironic deployment. So I think we can move on from installers for now and start looking to some other areas. So scaling and constraints is something that's a, uh, People often ask, like, okay, how many conductors? Sorry, how many nodes can one conductor, you know, manage? And it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult question to, to ask because it depends on many things. Um, we have this concept called conductor groups. The intention of conductor groups was to uh, to um, categorize nodes by some physical aspect of the architecture, be that data warehouse, you know, rack different L2 network, um, whatever different failure domain is useful to you. 
Uh, and that, that was the intention of the feature, and it's, it is used for that. But it's, uh, it's also ended up being used for a, um, for a different purpose. So here we have a scenario where there's nothing physically separating the nodes, um, and yet they're still separated into, um, into groups. And the reason for that is um, Nova Compute is optimized for uh, dealing with a number of um, services, resources, which you could reasonably fit on you know, a single compute node. But in the ironic scenario, every Nova Compute has uh, a view of every single uh, bare metal node as a resource. And part of its uh, function is to constantly loop through every available resource and make sure it's up to date in the Nova state layer. Um, this becomes a scalability issue when, when, uh, you're, when you're managing a, a certain number of nodes. Um, it takes a longer time for uh, Nova state to come up to date, and there's load across the whole cluster as it, as it does this work. So a, a kind of workaround solution to this um, is using conductor groups as a sort of pseudo sharding mechanism. This lets uh, Nova be configured to a particular conductor, and that conductor is configured to a particular group of nodes. So Nova only sees those nodes. Um, and that solved the problem, but this is not what it, the groups were designed for. So I, I said in the um, abstract that there would be a um, specific real-world example of, of a working architecture. And thanks to CERN, um, I can show this, uh, the, the, the way they're using conductor groups specifically. Um, so they have around 20 conductor groups. Um, each of those groups are managing around 500 nodes. Um, and they each have a, a Nova Compute uh, dedicated VM uh, an ironic VM which has a collection of ironic services that are required. Now, there's also a special group which doesn't have a Nova attached to it, and that's just for um, burn-in tasks for new hardware. So with this setup, they're currently managing about um, 8,700 nodes in a uh, single uh, Nova compute cell that's dedicated to B-Metal. Um, I had to update that number after Ulrich's talk this morning. Um, they expect in the next year or so that uh, they'll be managing around 10,000 nodes, which is you know, really quite impressive. So some things to consider when, uh, when you're deciding uh, what kind of ratio between nodes and conductors you, can, you should expect. Um, you know, one, we've just talked about um, Nova responsiveness for the resource tracking overhead, um, the CPU load of, our, of ironic conductor, not just of Nova constantly polling it, but um, for its, you know, the periodic jobs that um, ironic um, is running, you know, like, such as to poll the um, power state, etc. cetera. Um, how dynamic your workloads are, and by that I mean uh, are nodes constantly being redeployed uh, that would require, you know, that, that results in uh, API activity, conductors that are, uh, are doing work, or are they relatively static workloads where they're deployed once and then from that point on the only overhead is, you know, periodic, periodic tasks like power management. Um, so all those points are kind of around um, how many conductors, we, we, but you know, as, as we saw, uh, a single node ironics is a perfectly valid case, the kind of appliance scenario. And if you do a bit of tuning, um, you can you know, manage around 1,000 nodes on a single node open stack. Uh, sorry, a single node um, ironic. So that at least gives, gives you uh, an idea of the parameters for scaling even though I can't give you an exact answer. But in the real world, you know, some operators uh, have a firm policy of 300 nodes per 
uh, conductor. Some have a firm policy of 500, as we saw with CERN. So, you know, that gives you the kind of range that, that people are currently doing in the real world. So, we have in the pipeline uh, a solution to uh, the conductor groups for sharding uh, situation. Um, in Ironic, there is now a uh, dedicated shard ID uh, attached to each node, and there's a minimal API to manage the shard IDs for all your nodes. And it's also possible to, when you're requesting all nodes, to filter by that shard ID. So this allows us to sort of decouple, in the, in the Nova case, uh, de decouple computes from conductors. Uh, while still making it possible to uh, group uh, nodes uh, to computes, so that uh, computes have a limited view of the, the full pool, um, and you know, we can have a proper uh, scalable sharding solution. Um, this support is, has been added in Antelope, in Ironic, um, so if you need this kind of sharding mechanism, beyond Nova, then you can do that now. Uh, the Nova support is still in progress. Uh, I would tentatively say it will happen in the cycle, but please don't hold me to that. So another thing to consider when you're designing your Ironic is your end users. Uh, ideally, you'll be wanting to make your end users as happy as possible and empower them to do what they want to do. And one aspect of that is giving them uh, an API that they uh, are already familiar with and like using. And as, as we've seen with the installers, there's, there's three quite distinct uh, ways of interacting with Ironic. The traditional one would be uh, through the Nova server API. And if your users are um, you know, deploying virtual machine workloads, you know, it's, it's a compelling case that um, they could uh, deploy bare metal workloads using the, the same API, same tooling. Um, and that, that is traditionally what is how Ironic has been used. But it's not the only way. Uh, there's also directly with the Ironic API. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, actually useful to um, have full access to the, the bare metal state. Um, let's say, if, if they're more in the, in the uh, model of wanting to uh, provision a specific bare metal server rather than you know, just taking one from a pool, um, having access to uh, failure reasons and the, the actual state of the node uh, can be extremely useful in that scenario. And it is possible to provide a Nova-like experience by using the client side uh, library and app called Metalsmith. And what I would sum up the Nova like experience as would be one, uh, it, it will manage the neutron ports for you. Um, and two, uh, it gives you uh, an allocation API so that you can request, you can say, I, I want a bare metal node uh, with these constraints. Um, and it will find a free node from the pool that meets those constraints and give that to you. And finally, we have the Kubernetes API. I mean, increasingly, our users are going to be uh, most comfortable with uh, managing Kubernetes resources. So being able to manage bare metal as a uh, Kubernetes resource would be uh, very compelling for them, especially if they had no exposure to OpenStack APIs at all. And in fact, anecdotally, um, we're hearing about um, a lot of people who are, you know, who say, yeah, we don't use any OpenStack components. Uh, we don't use Ironic for bare metal provisioning because we use Metal Cubed. So they're actually not aware that they're using Ironic under the hood, which is, I mean, it's good and bad. So a relatively recent feature that we believe is mature enough to start using now is uh, virtual media boot. This is a feature of the Redfish driver, um, which uh, enables quite a different uh, deployment uh, flow. And it has implications for networking. So 
So just coming back to that call sequence that we uh, looked at at the beginning. Um, I could just uh, highlight what could be considered level two network services. DHCP, definitely, definitely an L2 service. TFTP uh, doesn't scale beyond networks. It doesn't scale well uh, with a uh, number of nodes or with a quantity of data. So we kind of think of it as a level two service as well. But what if we didn't have that restriction? Uh, this is actually the case with uh, virtual, um, virtual media boot. Um, so here we have uh, a deploy is being triggered uh, when using the Redfish driver with virtual media boot. Um, Ironic will build a custom ISO and it will, uh, with Redfish calls, it will attach that ISO as a virtual device on the node, such as, you know, like a, a virtual CD-ROM. So that when the node boots, um, it will immediately be executed. Um, and that ISO is Ironic Python agent. So it cuts out that whole uh, first bootstrap part of the provisioning process. And we're immediately into um, the actual um, provisioning tasks where the agent is communicating uh, with Ironic and um, downloading the image, writing the image, and that's it. So um, this, is, this is quite a game changer and it does have implications for um, the network architecture because we no longer need the uh, direct access to the uh, network interface that's on the provisioning network. So this is just a, a repeat of the metal cubed um, architecture. If we no longer have this requirement, then it could look like this. So the pod can just be a normal pod. Uh, the network um, accessibility to the nodes um, doesn't have to be L2, it can be more. It's, it's you know, very much still desirable to have a dedicated provisioning network um, but those L2 restrictions have been lifted, so um, it's, uh, it's considerably more flexible. Um, one of the more um, complex scenarios that we deploy our overcloud on is uh, with a spine and leaf uh, network configuration. This has really good performance characteristics and also um, better uh, failure uh, redundancy. So it's, it's, it's quite compelling for a lot of our um, operators. And in this scenario, we've got Ironic running on the bottom left leaf, which means that um, the, the leaves on the right uh, need to have uh, configured, uh, sorry, the leaf switches on the right need to have a DHCP relay uh, so that the DHCP requests can reach back to the Ironic. Uh, which is fine, but you know, it's, it's configuration com complexity. Um, if DHCP messages aren't coming through, it's, you know, it's gonna be a pain to, to debug. So it's, it would be nice to not to have that complexity on top, of, uh, on top of the configuration of the spine and leaf. And that is the case uh, when we're using virtual media boot. So um, some final takeaways. Um, now, I'd just like to reiterate, you know, different deployment tools have uh, opinionated architectures, to, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, your end users have preferences about the kind of APIs they would prefer to use, um, so it's, it's nice to keep them happy. Um, you've got a few things to consider when you're uh, working out your conductor to node ratio based on, you know, node usage type of workload, et cetera. And I'd say a virtual media boot is ready and it removes network, network architecture constraints. But some hardware vendors are more ready than others. So I would recommend doing your own evaluation um, before you're making uh, firm decisions about you know, your network architecture based on the assumption that it'll just work. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. So, uh, yeah, any questions? No? Yes? Good. <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay, thanks so much.